Mary said, My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and my spirit rejoices in you, my Savior, for you have looked with favor upon your lowly servant. And from this day forward, all generations will call me blessed. For you, the Almighty, have done great things for me, and holy is your name. Your mercy reaches from age to age for those who fear you. You have shown strength with your arm. You have scattered the proud in their conceit. You have deposed the mighty from their thrones and raised the lowly to high places. You have filled the hungry with good things while you have sent the rich away empty. You have come to the aid of Israel, your servant, mindful of your mercy, the promise you made to our ancestors, to Sarah and Abraham and their descendants forever. During this Advent season, as we consider the image of a pregnant woman, we are painfully aware that this image is not a neutral one. For some, the image of a pregnant woman conjures up reminders of happy days, of gratitude for the experience of being able to carry life, the joy and the blessing of the birth of a child. While for others it is a reminder of a deep longing, a desire to experience pregnancy. For some parents it is a painful reminder of a time when you've had to bury a child or children that you've carried in your womb and in your heart. For some this is a painful picture and reminder of not being able to conceive or not being able to carry to term or the memory of a miscarriage. And so as we approach the season, as we consider this image, we hold in our conversation, in our imagination and in our prayers, all the feelings that come to us as we consider pregnancy. And know that all of these feelings and emotions are part of the story that God is weaving into the bigger story of God's love and God's life. And so as we hold it, we hold it tenderly. We hold it with anticipation. And we hold it with reverence. Hi, I'm Michelle Schrader, the pastor at Good Samaritan United Methodist Church in Tallahassee, Florida, and I welcome you to week one of Singing Mary's Song. This is an Advent journey through the Magnificat with four different women from different backgrounds, with different points of view and different um, perspectives, and we'll be journeying through Mary's Magnificat for the four weeks of Advent. So we welcome you to this space. This week, we're going to be hearing from Renee August all the way from Cape Town, South Africa. Um, she's an Anglican priest in the Cape Town Diocese of the Anglican Church there. Um, Renee serves with an amazing organization called The Warehouse. It's a nonprofit um, that works to resource leaders to be able to live out the peace and justice of God's um, hope for the world. And so we give thanks for Renee and her work in South Africa and the gift of her joining us for this four week study. Welcome Renee. Thank you so much, Michelle. And thank you for everyone else um, for your participation. Thank you to Esther and to Latricia. It's been a joy just having these conversations with you. I bring you greetings from the lands known as South Africa, the home of Harry and Krotoa, the Khoi Khoi and the Sand people. I bring you greetings from my organization, The Warehouse, where I am formed and shaped and transformed through the loving relationships of my colleagues. Thank you too to Michelle for the invitation to share in this conversation around Advent. And so I 
became curious about why Advent is important in the life of the church. The Hebrew scriptures remind us repeatedly of the commandment to remember. As if God knew that we would forget. And so this season of Advent for me is a reminder again and again of the story of God and how we find our place in God's story. And so as we approach this text, we can see that it's clear that Mary knew not only her story, but the story of God. When we only know our story, we can make the mistake of thinking that our story is the story. And so Mary is very clear that this visitation from the angel is God weaving her life into God's bigger story, God's bigger story of promise and of liberation. When we reduce the story of God to our story, it's as if we're sitting in a field of flowers and staring only at one petal. And so as we explore Mary's story, this song in the broader story of liberation and hope, it is my prayer that our stories will be woven together with one another into the bigger story of God. Mary's visited by an angel. She's young, she's poor, she's living in an occupied territory, surrounded by political unrest and people warring for power. Mary's world is run by the Roman Empire. Trickle-down economics leaves her and her family and her ancestors impoverished and strangers in a land that they once owned. The parallels of Mary's story and ours today is purely coincidental. There's a story though, the story of God that is woven into Mary's life. And this story is a promise of hope that God will bring an end to oppression, an end to hatred, an end to injustice, an end to the superiority complex of those who cause pain. Those who, without consideration, keep their knees on the necks of those who suffer racial hatred and oppression. Jesus takes on the life of this hated race and is born Jewish within this Roman Empire to a woman who is Jewish from a land contested in Palestine. It is this story that gives the context to the song. And in some ways, it's as if this story requires some kind of break. It cannot go on like this anymore. And then there's the visitation from the angel. Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the Spirit will conceive in you a gift from God for the whole world. The season of Advent for me is a reminder to the church, not only of the bigger story of God, but the truth that all of us are pregnant. Yes, all of us. I don't care how old you are. Yes, you gentlemen, men, women, of all ages, every person in the body of Christ is pregnant because the Spirit of God comes to brood over us and to conceive in each one of us into our hearts, into our spirit, into our imagination, a gift of God for the world. We, like Mary, are invited into the story of God. We have an opportunity to offer ourselves like Mary did, to respond with her words, let it be to me as you have said. And in saying yes to the Spirit conceiving God's dreams and God's gift for the world in us, we too begin 
like Michelle referred to that painting, we begin to, to carry something in us, something that grows. It grows in us expectation and anticipation. The wondering for me is what is it that you are expecting? In a life of a fly, pregnancy lasts 12 to 24 hours. The lifespan, about 28 days. For a dog, 58 to 68 days, and they live 10 to 15 years. For a cow, 41 weeks. And cows live between 18 and 22 years. An elephant, however, is pregnant for 18 to 22 months and they live for 60 to 70 years. Do you notice that the length of your pregnancy is directly proportionate to the size of your expectation? How long have you been pregnant for? What are you expecting? Pregnancy comes to us in the midst of stubborn hope. It requires of us expectation. Pregnancy allows us to feel not only the growing, but the kicking, the morning sickness, the leaping inside. What are you pregnant with today? How long have you been pregnant? What has this expectation grown inside of you? My final thought about this song is that in the midst of Mary's life, pregnancy comes to us as protest. Pregnancy protests against death, death blowing devices of injustice and poverty. I was at a wedding for a friend in the Congo and heading on over to Goma, the city was overrun by militia. The border was closed and we couldn't enter into the country. We were told that they had to clear the bodies off the street before they could open the border. Just an hour before the wedding, the border gates were opened and we were able to go in to go to his wedding in the midst of that insane time to, to sing and to celebrate. The following morning we went to church together. I had no idea that it was Baptism Sunday. More than 30 babies baptized. The whole shebang. Parents, godparents, families, babies everywhere. I wept through most of that service. Nothing spoke of a protest against death quite like 30 crying babies. Pregnancy is protest. Pregnancy says, I have a bigger dream. I belong to a bigger story. What is now is not what will be forever. forever. The affirmation of our hope. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. What is your story? Is your story only giving you an expectation to live through COVID-19? Is your story giving expectation that it would live through a transition of injustice? The invitation of God's story is that we, together with God, would not only live in this liminal place of waiting and expectation, but in this time of expectation that you and I will allow the Spirit again and again to conceive inside of us, the gifts of God for the blessing of the whole world.
I think that deserves an amen. Hey. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and honestly, if I had one, I would pass one that round. Uh <laughs> I just want to know, you know, how she expected that we're supposed to sit through all of that preaching and just, you know, <laughs> like kind of nod. I was, I was giving an amen and a shout and a run around all inside of me. Okay. I all mean, right. I was going like this. Under right? the camera, so, like, <laughs> no, no. Oh, my gosh. That's powerful. Gosh, I think the like the way you open up pregnancy as protest is not something we hear about during Advent very often. Um, you know, I think the way the way we look at Mary's song historically is not at all like a protest song, right? It's like I always say it's something that's it's sung in concert halls with people in fur coats, and it's it's really not taken in context oftentimes. But to think that here she was this pregnant young girl um, protesting to the night, protesting to the injustice of her times and how we can look at this song and really find hope in it in the days of waiting in our own spaces um, of wrestling and, and just wanting something different for the world. I mean, that's just such a powerful word for sure. Yeah. It, um, so Renee, like, I love that. And the other piece that grabbed me, you know, the mathematician, when you start talking about being directly proportional to, and so just, <laughs> just talking about how um, the length of our pregnancy being directly proportional to lifespan and how many people, you know, listening, watching, um, thinking through all of what you said, have been pregnant, right? Metaphorically with so many things for so long. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes us a while to give birth to all that God has put on the inside of us, right? And so immediately something leapt inside of me that said we can get excited about the life expectancy of the thing that we're about to give birth to. Man, like. I felt tears wanting to form and I am not a crier, right? I am not a crier. I'm a laugher, laugher. but I wanted to weep um, when I heard that statement because it says, you know, just wait for it and not just wait for it, but wait for it expecting something beyond what we can think or imagine to live and to live for generations, to live for a very long time. So just thank you for that word. Yeah, that part actually stood out to me too uh, as a fellow super impatient person who uh, will more often just be recite the how long, oh Lord, and where you at God, you ain't showing up. Right. <laughs> so that was, that was powerful in that even the waiting itself somehow is the stubborn hope. Like even the waiting itself is the resistance, like, e that, that really just hit me personally. Um, I think also just because this scripture is often one that we we can ask ourselves, uh, especially those of us who overthink things, um, like, what does that mean now, God? You said you did all these things, but I still see people out here with knees on their necks. Um, what does this passage mean? Um, and to me, that made it like, again, almost like the... One of my favorite quotes from Coretta Scott King is that the the struggle is kind of almost born again in every generation. So it almost made me think of like this song being birthed in every generation too, like being sung in a new uh, key uh, to the same struggle and to continue to say in the midst of death, no, uh, life is the truth. Um, yeah. That was really powerful, yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, just powerful beyond measure. Because as you said, Esther, I get tired of waiting. You know, I resonate with how long, oh Lord, like this is ridiculous. If you said you're coming for us, I'm gonna need you to come for us. When are you gonna show up, right? And so it reminds me or, or tells me, Renee, that in this waiting, what do I expect to happen and how long will it live? 
because now I'm saying, all right, this is taking a long time. So whatever's on the other side of this weight that's going to finally come forward, it is going to live a long, long, mm. long time. Mm. I'm expecting life now. Wow. You know, the other thing that I heard, I mean, when we're talking about this waiting, that that we oftentimes hear people say waiting isn't just kind of sitting back on your couch, just twiddling your thumbs. It's an active waiting. And when you started in the beginning, you were starting to talk about Mary having the word of God like alive in her. It was like her song was born from the song of her people, uh, from the study of the scriptures throughout the course of their life together. And that, that that word wasn't just a word for her, that it was her um, having an, an, a larger vision of God's work in the world than just what God was doing in her life, that she could see a, an expansive view of the overarching work of God um, because of that word working itself out in her. Um, and so that was also powerful for me to think about like, our study of the scriptures sometimes for some people might be monotonous, you know, but that when that word becomes a living part of who you are, mm -hmm. it, it's the way you see the world. It's the way you form your minutes of your days. And, and it's the vision you have um, for, for what God is doing all around us. Um, so I think that was really powerful for me to hear you kind of just root us in that, that overarching story that was just in her. So, so Renee, I have a question for you. <laughs> what are you waiting to give birth to in this season of your life? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, I mean, very practically, I I want to buy a farm. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, I. I work at the warehouse and we we talk about, you know, living out the peace and justice of God in a way that brings an end to poverty and justice and division. And I, I seem to be more interested in what are the causes of poverty, injustice and division. And so I think it's important for us to have models of how new whole systems um, can create new life. And so the in South Africa, the biggest consequences of apartheid is um, there's economic ones. And so poor, i.e. black people, don't have equity um, because of the land acts and displacement and um, land expropriation without compensation to black people. Uh, there's no access to land. Um, when black people go to the bank, generally the only financial relationship with the bank is one where they're in debt. Mm. Um, food security or food insecurity. Uh, people work, you know, six days a week, 48 to 50 hours a week just to put food on the table. So what would it look like if we, if we just grew food and gave it away? And so, okay, now you've got food on the table. Now what do you want to work for? Um, and then education, the disparity in the apartheid government's education budget is almost identical um, to the economic inequality that we see in South Africa today. And so what does a revised, uh, restored education system look like? Um, and so all of those, it's not the one or the other. It's a how can we live all of those up? And for me, that's that dream is it's a farm where we're producing our own food, where we're saving together, where we're educating children together, where we're running small businesses, where we're supporting, you know, networks of people. So, yeah, that's it's been there for about 10 years now. <laughs> wow, a 10 year pregnancy. So that thing is going to live. I was thinking, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Proportional anyway. to the, the impact it will have. <laughs> yes. And the lasting. Yeah. Sorry, mm -hmm. that was a bit of a ramble, but um, that's that's good stuff. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. It was amazing. 
Thank you for the uh, the voice that you add to this song that has been sung from the beginning that Mary added her voice to and that you have added your voice to and how it reverberates uh, even just in our lives and will reverberate in the lives of those who have yet to come, Renee. Yes, thank you, Renee. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so great to have four women, four different voices, four different perspectives, different ages. It's going to be an amazing journey for sure, but we're grateful for your voice, Renee, and your willingness to join us through these virtual channels um, to give us your perspective. Yes. And the next week, everybody, we have another song being sung. And that's, do we tell them who, should we tell them who's singing the next song or just let them be surprised? What do you say? Go ahead and tell them. All right. Our next song is being sung by Reverend Michelle Schrader. So make sure you tune in next week for Singing Mary's Song. Yay.